stop just a little bit soon. Actually, your home was a very busy place, but in addition to the regular customers, you had a Jewish woman, then her baby, then a rabbi, then the whole family, and as quickly as you could locate a place for them and get them out, then others would take their place. And then there came a bricklayer and a painter and workers who built the hiding place in your bedroom, which became the secret chamber for you to hide the Jews when the Gestapo came. Uh, who sleeps here? I do. Perfect. February 28, 1944, when you were very sick with influenza, the Gestapo came, not just to make their rounds, but this time to arrest and imprison you. And uh, Betsy and your father and you were taken to prison in Holland. And your father died there. And years before, he'd said that he would consider it a great privilege to die for the Jews. of solitary confinement, Betsy and you were taken by a boxcar to Ravensbrück, Germany. We have here a woman tonight who was in, uh, as do you say, Schaffenigen prison in Holland the same time you were there. She was formerly of Holland, now she lives in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, and her name is Diet, and we want to welcome Diet. than in prison. <laughs> <laughs> you do too. <laughs> but I only saw you when we were all loaded in the train, remember? Because I was sitting a few cells away from Betsy. But of course, we didn't know who our neighbors were in prison. And we saw it when we were all loaded in that train. And then we were in that first barrack in Fecht, remember? I bought a few things along. Do you remember that we had to eat out of those? <laughs> And do you remember the wooden spoon yes. yesterday? <laughs> and do you remember this? This is a miniature of the Kubelton. <laughs> oh, what is this? I missed that last little word. I don't know, but that was the version of our toilets in ah. prison. <laughs> ah. But it's a miniature. Ah. You know, Date and Corey, 96,000 women died in Robinsburg. Betsy was one of them. And through a miracle of a clerical error, Corey, you were released just the week before all the women of your age were scheduled yes. to be executed. Terms completed, 21st, terms 44. So that's the story of Corey Ten Boom. Um, she and her family lived in Holland during World War II. Her family was uh, watchmakers, which gave them great cover to help people because there's always people coming in and out of their home. And as you saw in the video, um, they had a false wall built in her bedroom. So as the Gestapo regularly made rounds, they had a system of secret knocks and codes that Jews could go up and hide in that hiding room. There's a book in our library, if you've ever read it, it's incredible, there's a, there's a movie as well called The Hiding Room. And I would like to think that many of us, if we we're in a similar situation, that we would try to help others if that were um, us in World War II. Can I 
Would you, would you agree with that statement? And it's interesting. When they got finally raided and Corey, her sister, and her dad were arrested, there were actually a family of Jews hiding in that room that day, and they couldn't get word to them until the next day that it was all safe. They, they had a special knock. It was all safe. They came out, and the family never heard it, and it was 24 hours later that they were finally released from that hiding space. But there's a little interesting conundrum, isn't it? Because to hide the Jews would mean being deceptive towards the Germans. I don't think any of us would have a problem with that, correct? Right? Corey was literally the leader of the Underground Railroad for her part in Holland during World War II. But there's another interesting um, conundrum we have when we get to this, is what does it mean to bear false witness? Because in this circumstance, if you think about it, to be loyal to the Jews would mean to be deceptive to the to Germans, right? Um, our big idea today is simply this. Don't allow our words to defame your good name. So we're going to look at the ninth command. Um, we're going to open up our Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, uh, 1 to 17. Um, I can't look behind me. The page number's up there. We're in the New King James Version. What? 43. Thank you, Charlotte. Again, I'm flying. I'm literally doing this blindfolded today, so um, bear with me a little bit. But why don't we stand, and we're going to read through um, Exodus 20, 1 through 17. Again, we're doing this because in the Old Testament, when they read the law, the people stood. So it seems appropriate for this series. So God spoke all these things, saying that I am the Lord your God, brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself a carved image of any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me, keep my commands. You should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is the Sabbath, of the Lord your God, and that you should do no work, nor um, your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that the days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Have a seat. As we go through this, we have two points this morning. The first point is simply the ninth commandment. And in this, there's two ways of thinking it. You should not bear false witness against your neighbor. And the idea of bearing false witness, in the most easy of contexts, is that you are called as a witness to give testimony to something you've seen or to something you're a part of. Anyone ever have the privilege of serving on jury duty? Nod your head. How many of you are looking forward to that next card? Anybody? Sometimes we don't get the privilege of jury duty. Sometimes we get the privilege of being part of the case, right? whether you saw something or you witnessed something. And in this case, the idea is you should not bear false witness, that you should give an honest testimony. And our courts are based upon 
witnesses being truthful. It's why when you go in the court, they make you put your hand on the word of God and they say, you shall promise to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, truth right? What's the word that keeps getting repeated? Right? That your words won't defame your good name, right? That you're going to be honest in everything you say and give testimony to. In the Old Testament, there is this uh, command here in Deuteronomy 19. It says, if a, witness, if a false witness excuse me, rises against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing, and the judge shall make careful inquiry. And indeed, if the witness is a false witness and has testified falsely against his brother, then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother, so you shall put away the evil from among you. So you know what the um, punishment for perjury was in Bible time? It was whatever the verdict would have been. So in other words, if it was a capital offense and you were testifying in a case and they were trying to put the defendant to death and you were a false witness and they found out about it, you know what your punishment would be? It wouldn't be probation or a fine. That would come against you. Right? So the idea is that you don't let your words defame your good name, that you're going to be an honest and forthright witness. So there's the application in the courts, and then the second application is the application in everyday life. And to that, we're going to go to the teachings of Jesus. Um, we're going to flip around a little bit this morning. So if you um, can, open up to Matthew 5.33, page 5.53 in your pew Bible. And we're going to read a little bit from the, the Sermon on the Mount. Verse 33 says, Again, you have heard that it was said of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor the, by the earth, for it is footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is a city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no be no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. So you've heard it said of old, you should not swear, you should not bear false witness. The Pharisees' problem is they were making these great oaths, like, I swear by the temple to do this. Or I swear by the earth I will do this. And then when the time came to, to fulfill it, they would say something, well, I swore by the temple, but, but not the gold in the temple. Or I swore by heaven, but not by the throne of God. And people who found the religious leaders to be very deceptive, that they couldn't trust them. Can you imagine that, being a follower of God, and people don't know where you stand with your word? And Jesus says, look, look, you make all these great promises. Why don't we just make this simple? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And anything more than that, you're trying to deceive somebody in your life. Right? Don't let your words defame your great name. Right? So when you say something, you should do it. No excuses allowed. So don't bear false witness against your neighbor. When you tell your neighbor, when you tell someone that you're going to be there, you know what you should do? Show up. And we'll get into this a little bit later. Some of you might ask, well, who is my neighbor? Right? And Jesus tells a, a parable a little bit later about the story of the Good Samaritan. And the idea of the, good, the story of the Good Samaritan is the, the stranger, the foreigner, was the one who helped. And that your neighbor really is anyone you come in contact with. I know growing up, I always thought of my neighbors, the people who lived on my left or my right, or the people who lived on my block, or the people who lived in my neighborhood. But really, your neighbors are everyone you can come in contact to, with. So, 
Some of you live in Dover. I can't see your house from my house, but you are still my neighbors, right? Or think of it from a kid's perspective. They go to class, and students come from all over the town. And yet they regularly come in contact with them, right? So that would be the neighbor who sits across the aisle from them, or they share a desk with in class. There's also one interesting um, problem we have to deal with this. Because it says, don't bear false witness against your neighbor. It doesn't say, do not lie. Right? And other commands are very specific. Like last week, don't steal. Well, who does it apply to? Well, it applies to everybody. Don't steal what? Anything. Whether it be someone's property or someone's ideas or another person. Remember last week, the ripple effects just kept going and going and going. And if God wanted to, he could have said, don't lie, right? And we would know that to mean never lie. But it's interesting. It doesn't say don't lie, right? It says do not bear false witness. By the way, how many of you talk like that, that you know what, I'm not going to bear false witness? It seems a little bit of old English, does it not? In Sunday school, I made the comment, um, to my class, you know, growing up in the city, if I were to talk like that, I probably would have gotten beat up. And it's because when you read the Old Testament, there's two instances where you could say, well, they're being a little less than honest, and yet God seems to be in it. Right? Um, there's Rahab lying for the spies, and again, we, we're not going to go into both of them, but there's also this one Pharaoh killing the Hebrew babies. You're like, ooh, it just got a little dark in here. I'm going to read Exodus 1. If you're still in Exodus for the Ten Commandments, you can flip through a couple pages back. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Sapar. And the name of the other one was Puar. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you should kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Therefore God dwelt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. Does that story make sense to anybody, especially the ladies out there? Right, there's three parts. First part, Pharaoh is fearful of the Israelites. They're growing in number, and he realizes, you know what, they're going to outnumber us, and if they get their act together, they can overthrow us. We got to do something to kind of rein in their numbers. So, when they give birth, if it's a female, good. But if it's a male, we're going to immediately kill them. And you have these two women caught in the middle. What do you do? Kind of the same thing with Corey Ten Boom and, and hiding the Jews. What do you do? What is right in this situation? So, they feared God. They kept his commands, and they covered for the Hebrew women. So these two women get called back before Pharaoh, and they say, why aren't you killing the male children? And what do they say? Are they honest? Well, they give birth too fast. Really? Like, you don't understand. This is like TV. It's like one push, and the kid's L. You ever watch a birth on TV? It's like three seconds. It's like right, one push and boom, there goes the watermelon, right? 
Finally, someone's with me. I mean, nod your head if you had at least an hour of labor, right? Or nine. You know, or, like, I've known people who've been in labor for 40 hours or more. God bless them, right? So they come before the Pharaoh, it's like, look, it's like five minutes, what, what can I do? They're obviously lying, right? What, you, you ladies disagree with me? And it's interesting, they lied to Pharaoh, right? Don't bear false witness. Because there's two witnesses in this case, right? Are you on the, the Hebrew baby side or are you on Pharaoh's side? Because you can't be on both. You know, Corey, is she on the Jew side or is she on the German side? Because you can't be on both, right? You know, Rahab, is she on the spy side or is she on Jericho's side? Because you can't be on both, right? You're, gonna, you're going to give your testimony to one side of this. And I think the principle is God values life. So there's two instances in the Bible, and there's probably one or two in real life. By the way, these are instances that we'll probably never come in contact with, but I think this is the reason why the command is don't bear false witness instead of thou shalt not lie, because you have these two instances in the Bible that you have this life or death situation, and what do you do? What do you do if someone comes in your house, pulls a gun at you, and your kids are in the closet, and they ask, is there anyone else in the house? How many of you go, yeah, 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 in the closet? How many of you go, nope, just me? Right? Again, not real life, not everyday life, but this is the difference, right? Because in that situation, who are you, who are you the witness for, your kids or the guy with the gun? And we're going to say, our kids, right? So don't let your words defame your good name, right? Your words, if you give up your kids, is going to defame your name in front of your family or in front of the people who are hiding in your bedroom or in front of all the Jewish women giving birth. If you're still there, look at the last two, two verses. So God, they feared God caused the effect God allowed those two women then to have families. So you see in this situation, God blesses their actions in choosing the Hebrew women over the Egyptian pharaoh. Right? Just like God blessed Corey, just like God blessed uh, Rahab, the, the prostitute. So, I think you understand what we're saying, right? This is the extreme circumstance, but I think this is the reason why this is written this way. Um, second point, moving on. We asked three quick key questions. What does this say about the character of God? So Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be... That as children of God, as people of God, that our word should 100% be reliable. Right? We would nod our head and say yes with that, right? Why should our word be reliable? Because God's word is 100% reliable. God is 100% good and 100% honest and 100% trustworthy and 100% love. That Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That God doesn't bear false witness against us. He's not trying to pull the wool out of our eyes, right? Or over our eyes. So we know that this is God's word. This is his testimony to us. We know it's 100% true and we can trust it. So when it says in the Bible that God so loves the world, that he loves you. And he loves you as much on your worst day as he does on your best day. That God so loves you that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him doesn't have to perish, but can have everlasting life. That God is not making this up. He's not trying to trick you. That when you breathe your last, if you trusted in Jesus, you can be assured of everlasting life in heaven. Right? When the Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, you know what that means? You know who's part of whoever? Well, you are, right? That you can be assured that God formed you, that God made you, that God has a plan for your life. 
that God's love for you is real, and God isn't changing. So God's plan of salvation is good, as good as it is today, as it was yesterday, as it is forever. That he's the way, the truth, and the life. That no one can get to God the Father except through Jesus, right? And what does it say about God? That he can be relied upon, that he can be counted on. That we should seek him with all of our heart. But he isn't changing. Praise the Lord, right? Now, what does this say about us? Right? It is Sunday morning. We're all in church. Why do you got to be reminded to not bear false witness? Why do we got to be reminded that your yes be yes and your no be no? Why do we got to be reminded to not let our words defame our good name? It seems like something we should be telling to our kids, not having be told to us. Because it's easy to be a little bit lax with our words, is it not? Right? To tell a little white lie. Oh, no one will be hurt. It doesn't matter. That's what the world says, is it not? But as people of God, if God's not going to change with his words to us, we should be reliable in our words to other people. So how should we live? Um, there's a character there with a long rule list. You see that? I'm assuming it's there. Yeah, it's there. Okay, good. Um, we, have, we have a rule in our house. Believe it or not, my kids are not perfect. Some of you were over my house yesterday. At one point, I was in mid-conversation, and I saw my kid throw a football in the middle of Harmony Grove Road, and boom, made a beeline. First time you ever played football out front, I'm like, we don't do that. That's a crazy road. We don't, we don't. Anyway, my kids aren't perfect. You know what I have to do sometimes? I have to be the mediator. I have to be the judge, jury, and executioner for these little quabbles in my house. Now, your grandkids are a lot better than my kids, I'm sure. But, you know, even as a grandparent, sometimes you have to keep the peace. Nod your head if you ever have to have that role in your life, right? As a parent or grandparent. You remember those days, right? So we have a, we have a rule in our house, right? You only get one shot at being honest. So if I call Sophia, Chase, call Sydney, whomever, come before me, I look. And then often I'll remind them of this. Look, you get one shot at this. I want to know the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the, right? Don't be missing gaps in the story, right? Don't be leaving out stuff. Don't be blaming your sister or your brother. Look, I want the whole truth the first time, right? That's rule number one. Rule number two is dad's going to find out. Mom, we, we always find out what happened. And if I have to find out what happened, there's a double punishment. Now, if they're honest, they, they could still get punished. Like, we, we don't go like, oh, you're honest, you just get off. No, 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 no. You get a reduced sentence. Right? Well, that's real life, right? You plead guilty, what happened? They don't have to go through the, you know, the, the trouble of making sure that you are guilty to prove it. So you get a... So, if you're guilty, you get a sentence, right? Whatever it is. But if I got to find out, you get a double sentence. By the way, I'm usually a little angrier when I find out, so it might not even be a double, maybe like two and a half a sentence. It's like chasing your kids, right? You ever chase your kid and you're like, oh, wow, I get time to, to calm down. I get time to think this out. I'll be nice and rational when I grab my kid. Anybody? No, they're not getting a double sentence. It's like two and a half a sentence, right? But that's the thing, right? You did something. You're, you're already guilty. Be honest. Because if, because if you're not honest, you get a double sentence. The idea is I want you to be 100% forthright with whatever happened. And by the way, what I do with my kids is really what happens in real life. As you leave this place, and wherever you go, you only get one shot at being honest. 
And once you are dishonest, it's hard to get that integrity back. Where people might not view your word in the same way, right? And not being honest costs you things, right? It costs you with your kids. Man, my kids are young, and sometimes they are persistent. There's no one persistent like a four-year-old who wants something or a six-year-old who wants something. So sometimes as parents and grandparents, you know what we sadly do? Sometimes we say things just to make our kids be quiet. Oh, Dad, I want to play again. I want to play again. Okay. Oh, yeah, you know what? Yeah, we'll play that later. And later is like, for you, it could be like when they're 30. But when your kids, later is like 7 p.m. Like you're going to play later that day. Right? So your kid comes back. Hey, Dad, you said we're going to play later. How about we play right now? And sometimes you say things just to keep them quiet. You have no intention of keeping your word. You've been a false witness. You've given them a bad idea of what's really going to happen. Right? So in pushing off your kids, what does that do to your word? You've defamed your name, right? They don't know if you, they can trust you because, oh, there goes dad just pushing me off again. He's not really listening. He doesn't really care. And often what happens is when we give a false impression or a false idea, you know who we end up hurting? It's amazing how we end up hurting those people we say we love the most when we're not 100% honest with our words, right? Look, Jesus says, stop, stop giving oaths. Stop promising things that you don't have any intention of actually fulfilling, Right? It's better not to say anything than give a false idea. Oh, yeah, 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 don't worry, we'll play that later. Right? It's better just to be honest, like, look, I don't want to play. And then your little sweet girl starts crying. You're like, oh, I'm sorry. And, but it's amazing how we end up hurting those we love the most. Right? How many times we've made a promise, but. We have been short to fulfill it. How many times do we use an excuse, a white lie, to get out of things? Oh, honey, I would love to, but man, I'm just so slammed at work. And it's like, man, you seem like you're always slammed at work every time I want to do something. How many times do we make like a mountain out of a molehill? Like, right? We use a little excuse to cover something we just don't want to do. Right? How many times do we use our excuses? to not fulfill our words, and often, who does it end up hurting? Those people we love the most, right? Oh, but man, I really don't want to go over their house. They're so annoying and blah, 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 blah. Maybe I'll tell them the kids are sick, right? Yeah, well, you know what? We'll blame the kids for this one. Or you have car trouble, or you come across as not 100% honest. Right? And we're God's people, so we're a reflection of who God is. And God's 100% honest and truthful with us, and he expects us to be 100% honest and truthful with everybody else. So when they see you, they should know your yes is yes, and your no is no. And when you say you're going to do something, you actually fulfill and do it. And sometimes what that means is when you've given your word, you actually carry through and you do things you rather not do because you need to learn the lesson yourself. Remember my first winter up in western New York, I told this guy, John, we'd go ski. And I didn't really want to, but I kind of told him and I wish I had it. And he was all excited. So he bought ski passes. I'm like, you sure you want? We went skiing in 18 below zero weather. We were literally the only two people on that mountain that day. And every time down, I needed to go to the, to the hot tent to warm up my fingers because they were turning blue, though I had multiple pairs of gloves on. Oh, he would, he would have been up and down like, John, like I can't feel my fingers again. Literally, it was 18. That was the temperature. It was snowing and windy. 
And I'm from Philadelphia. I'm not used to that. No one is. But I remember saying, look, I told him I was going to go. I don't want to go. I want to push this off, but I should go. Right? You know what I learned? Really think through these things next time. Like, I wish I would have said, you know what? I like skiing, but not in 18 degrees below. No, that's crazy. Right? But your word costs you something. Right? Sometimes it costs you to fulfill it, but it often costs you more when you don't. For example, like, how many times does your word cost you at work? Because at work, it's easy to ask somebody else for something. Hey, can you help me out with this project? Hey, can you cover my shift for me? I want to fill in the blank. And then what happens? If you ask someone else to cover your shift, you know what they're going to eventually do? Ask you to cover theirs. Right? Do unto others as you have to do unto you. So they're fully within their way of doing that. And how many times do you want to work that Saturday in the middle of summer because you got a Saturday off in the middle of winter? Anybody. Right? So what's the temptation? I can't because make up an excuse, stretch a truth, tell a white lie. And by the way, they might buy it. But what does that do as a child of God in the middle of your work that God has called you to be a light to, that God has placed you to be a witness to, right? Look, God has put you in the situation that he wants you to. He's let you be born in the time, in the family. He's given you the career. Why? So that you would be his light in that dark place in the darkness of your schools, in the darkness of your work, in the darkness of your family, that you are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And how can you be the hands and feet of Jesus if people can't trust if your words are true? Oh, wow, he, he, he's inviting me to church for Christmas Eve. The only thing he ever says is lies to me. Why do I want to go to that church? It affects things, doesn't it? That our words defame our good name. And we become a poor reflection of of God who loves us. So, as we conclude this morning, we ask ourselves two questions. The first question here is, uh, oh, do people regard your word to the 100% reliability? Right? And really, it's a question that people see you as a person of integrity. Have people known that your yes is yes and your no is no? And if they ask you for a favor, you're going to do it because you are a reflection of God's love for them. And if we're honest, we've all had situations and relationships and things where we've not been 100% honest and forthright. And maybe there's a relationship that you need to go back and restore. And maybe it's going to cost you something, right? And maybe you'd rather not do it, but you're not doing it for your benefit. You're doing it for the benefit of the Lord and, and, and to be light in that situation. Right? Why? Because when we fail to keep our word, often we end up hurting those people we love the most. Hey, honey, I love you, but I'd rather not fill in the blank. Hey, I said we'd go this place this summer, but now... And by the way, sometimes your spouse will be considerate and sometimes your spouse will be loving and sometimes your spouse will understand. And sometimes, even if they understand, you should follow through anyway. Right? Because without sacrifice, I mean, love is seen through sacrifice, right? And sometimes you express your greatest forms of love when you sacrifice for your spouse or for your kids. Why? Because God's greatest sacrifice for us is the cross and that's also his greatest form of love, right? That God so loved you that he sent his son, that he came and he lived and he died on the cross to pay for your sins. I mean, even at the, even at the, at the garden, uh, Jesus is like, look, Father, is there another way? But ultimately, not my will, but your will be done. Right? Don't let your words defame your good name. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Let your commitments mean something. 
Um, let your integrity be seen to all those around you. Father, we thank you this day. You are good. Lord, we, we hear this command that we don't bear false witness, and, and perhaps that's not the way we would say it, but Lord, allow us not to give false impressions or false ideas. Allow our words to mean something that we are viewed as 100% honest and 100% forthright 100% of the time that our kids and our spouses and our workers, that those around us, they see you when they see us because they know our yeses are yeses and our noes are noes. And Lord, anything more than that's from the evil one. So Father, help us not to give false ideas or impressions, but Lord, allow us to be lights. Allow us to be good testimonies and stewards. Allow other people to see you when they see us. So, Father, um, we ask for your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, stand as we sing as we close this morning.